Hello. Welcome to NeoScribe. On September 8, 1944, Nazi Germany unleashed a weapon unlike anything anyone has ever seen on the battlefield. It was the V-2 rocket, which was the first long-range guided ballistic missile, developed by a team led by Dr. Werner von Braun. The missile was launched towards Paris and it created an impact crater 10 meters across, killing 6 people and wounding 36 more. Before the war was over, the Germans would launch over 3,100 rockets, killing and wounding thousands of people. But back in America, there was a scientist that was convinced that the Germans stole his ideas in order to build the V-2. You see, the scientist was developing and successfully launching liquid-propelled rockets while the Germans were just beginning their research, almost 20 years before the V-2's first launch. His name was Dr. Robert H. Goddard, he was one of the three fathers of rocketry, and this is his story. He was born on October 5, 1882 in Worcester, Massachusetts, which was a booming industrial city filled with innovation. He was a sickly child, but he had a passion for science since he was five years old, and he convinced his father to buy all kinds of science-related items such as microscopes, telescopes, and he would experiment with everything around him. He also read every book he could get his hands on from his local library, and he especially liked science fiction. But there was one particular book that would inspire him, and that was The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. And he would read that book many times in his childhood, and it gave him a sense of endless possibilities. And that inspiration led him to a pivotal moment. He was 17, and he climbed the ladder, leaned up against a cherry tree in order to cut off the dead branches. And so while he was up there, he started a daydream and he looked up into the sky and he imagined creating a device that would launch into the sky, into space, and ultimately travel to Mars. And it was at that moment he decided to dedicate his life to creating that device. So every day after school, he would read books on mathematics, astronomy, and mechanics, and he even attended lectures at various local colleges. Then in 1904, he started going to Worcester Polytech Institute, or WPI. And it was at WPI where he developed a lifelong daily routine which would be going to work or school during the day and then exploring his ideas on science and technology at night. And he would write all his ideas on green notebooks. And then in 1909, he pinpointed one of his ideas that he would focus on. And that idea was to burn explosives in tubes in a certain way that would propel the device forward. So he went on to receive his master's in physics in 1910 and his PhD in physics in 1911. And then on July 7th, 1914, he went on to file a patent for a rocket apparatus that included fundamental aspects and concepts that are still used in rockets today. The first idea was for multi-stage rockets, and the second was adapting a nozzle to the rocket, which essentially redefined the rocket motor. So Goddard came up with the nozzle feature when he realized that in order to make rockets practical, they had to be light as possible, but they also needed to eject gas from the rocket motor as fast as possible. And this invention of the combustion chamber and nozzle combination doubled the thrust and improved 25 times the efficiency of rockets. And this was the birth of the modern rocket engine. And then just a week later, Goddard was issued another patent for a rocket apparatus, and this laid out the description for a complete liquid-fueled system for his rocket motor. And it was this patent that made Goddard the father of liquid-fueled rockets. His life's work was so groundbreaking that he would go on to produce 214 patents, and many were issued after his death. In 1915, he decided to start with solid fuel rockets because he did not have the budget to develop liquid-fueled rockets yet. So what he did, he gathered a collection of commercial rockets such as ship rockets that used to pass lines between vessels and he began to experiment with them at Clark University's physics lab where he was a physics professor. So every day between 1915 and 1916, he experimented with many combination of rockets, nozzles, and powders and he started to gain a firm understanding of the physics of rocketry. But the most important discovery during this period was proving that rockets could produce thrust in space. Um, so what he did was he fabricated a vacuum chamber and mounted a rocket inside of it, and he measured the thrust as it was fired. And this discovery would be essential for the future of spaceflight. Also, during this time, he realized that he could only get so far on his current budget, so that's when he started to search out for funding for his research. So what he did in 1916, he wrote a letter to the Smithsonian proposing that his research in rocketry could provide the means to conduct experiments high into the atmosphere, much higher than the balloons that were used in those days. 
The letter was received by Acting Secretary of the Smithsonian, Dr. Charles Abbott, who was a pioneer in solar radiation research. Abbott was the first American scientist to study solar rays using balloons, and so the idea of using rockets really sparked his imagination. And so what he did was he told actual secretary of the Smithsonian, Dr. Charles Walcott, all of the discoveries that could be made using rockets, and then Walcott was on board. So after more correspondence on July 5th, 1917, the Smithsonian granted Goddard $5,000 for the development of a multi-charged solid-fueled rocket. A grant this size was rare in those days, and this made him a local celebrity. Goddard was ecstatic, and he wasted no time putting the money to use. He converted an old building at WPI into a workshop and laboratory, filling it with tools, machinery, and drafting boards. And by March, he was fully staffed with four machinists, and Goddard had them working on on a multi-charged solid-fueled rocket. But Goddard struggled with this concept, especially the reloading and firing mechanisms, and he realized he was going to need even more money. And at this time, the United States was entering World War I. Goddard would look to the War Department for more funding. So he consulted with Walcott and Abbott who suggested building a simpler rocket in order to have something to demonstrate to the War Department. Goddard was kind of reluctant to do that, but he finally agreed and he did shift focus to a single charge rocket in order to tap into military funding. And then at that point, Walcott was happy to support Goddard. You see, Walcott was the chairman of the military committee of the National Research Council, and he was well regarded, so he reached out to Major General George Squire of the U.S. Army, and he secured additional $10,000 for the project. And this money went to improving Goddard's lab, and to hire two toolmakers, a carpenter, a draftsman, and a chemist to work on powders. And despite spending $8,000 without producing a working model, Goddard provided photographs of his progress and the army allotted another $10,000. Soon after that, Goddard successfully test fired a single charge rocket weighing about two pounds and it flew about a half mile. It was actually at that point Goddard would find that he himself would need to travel because due to the suspicions of spies, Abbott had the entire project secretly moved to Mount Wilson, California in the summer of 1918. And it was there Goddard started developing something the military could use. And what he did was he developed a portable infantry rocket by constructing launching tubes that would allow soldiers to aim rockets at targets with longer ranges than grenades and mortars. Goddard and his team successfully demonstrated this portable infantry rocket to the army um, in 1918. But five days after that demonstration, the war ended. And uh, at that point, the army cut all the funding to these kind of projects. So for the next 12 years until 1930, Goddard would spend a lot of time trying to secure funds for his work. Um, he went back to WPI in 1918 and he continued his work on multi-charge solid fuel rockets with various approaches without much success. And then from 1920 to 1923, he served as a rocket consultant for the Navy. But it was during this time that he decided to abandon solid fueled rockets and he switched focus on liquid fueled rockets. And this was much more complex than solid fuels. So in order to construct a liquid-fueled rocket, Goddard had to design a combustion chamber that would receive, mix, and burn the fuel and oxidizer without causing an uncontrollable explosion. He also had to figure out how to feed the oxidizer into the chamber. And he experimented with various designs of chambers, pumps, and different kinds of chemicals which often resulted in the rocket engine jamming, sticking, or other kinds of failures. So take a look at what he came up with. Um, it looks much different than how rockets look today. You notice that the rocket engine is at the top and everything is held together by the actual fuel lines. <laughs> it's pretty wild, but you have to understand, I mean, he was pioneering this. So on March 16th, 1926, on a Massachusetts farm, it was blanketed in snow, Goddard launched a liquid propelled rocket that flew in the air for the first time, and it launched 12 and a half meters off the ground. And this was an incredible milestone, and at that point, Goddard switched focus on achieving higher and higher altitudes. Um, he worked on increasing the velocity of feeding the propellants into the engine. He also scaled up his designs um, so it could carry more fuel. And then in 1930, he received a big break by the Guggenheim family who uh, made a fortune mining silver and they supported Goddard's research, giving him a total of $100,000 over the next four years, which is equal to around $1.5 today. 
Um, so Goddard used the money to move his operations to Roswell, New Mexico, where he would work until around 1940, minus a few years in the 30s. But during this time, he would launch around 56 test launches, depending on the source. Um, but the highest altitude he achieved was over two and a half kilometers, which is pretty amazing for that time. So now let's go back to where we started with Dr. Werner von Braun and the V-2 rocket. Goddard died in 1945, just days before the end of World War II, and he died believing that the Germans stole his ideas. Depending on the source, some believe that von Braun used Goddard's plans from his journals in the design of the V-2. Uh, others believe that the V-2 was entirely a German production, that the rocket engine of the V-2 was based on a German patent from 1930, but it doesn't really matter if Goddard's ideas were stolen or not for the purpose of this video. I just want to illustrate just how groundbreaking his work was. After the war, the United States and the Soviet Union raced each other to capture as many of the designers of the V-2 that they could. The United States captured 126 principal designers alone, including Von Braun, who as you know would go on to be the chief architect of the incredible Saturn V rocket. So imagine if Goddard had that kind of support behind him. Imagine what he could do. When Goddard launched the liquid-propelled rocket for the first time in 1926, Von Braun was still 14 years old. The launch of Sputnik was 31 years away from happening, and Neil Armstrong was four years away from even being born. Alright, that's all I have for now. I hope you enjoyed your journey. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. I am Neoscribe, and I'll see you on the next journey.